morning. I think it's it's a great topic and a fantastic panel of speakers. So I'm sure you're going to have a great morning. And just a few slides by way of introduction. So my name is Professor Kate Robson Brown. I'm director of the Gene Golding Institute, um, and uh, this is this talk is part of a series that we're doing as part of Data Week Online. We've got 40 events over the five days. Um, the session is being recorded. It would be great if you could just check that you've read through our code of conduct. And I think Lily, our coordinator, is going to put that link in the in the chat in a moment, just in case. If you could mute your microphone, unless um, one of us kind of invites you to speak, that would be great. It improves um, kind of the background noise and um, any interference that we might have. For this session, we're going to invite you to um, put your questions in the chat box as the presentation goes on and we'll return to them at the end of the session. Uh, and at that point, we may ask you to, to speak or, or we may be able to just read out your questions. If you could complete the registration and feedback forms, that would be great. Feedback forms particularly really useful to us in terms of our planning for next year. And I know we can't do this face to face, um, but it'd be great if we could try and do leave as much opportunity for networking as possible. So if you could just introduce yourself in the chat box, your role, where you're from, what your interests are, that would be fantastic. Um, many of you will already be friends of the Gene Golding Institute and know what we're all about. But for those of you who are new to us, welcome. Great to have you join us. We are one of five of the University of Bristol Research Institutes. And the topic we focus on is data science, data intensive research. Um, we are um, constituted outside of the faculty structure, which gives us a good deal of independence. But our main remit is to support and develop multidisciplinary research um, communities around those topics. Uh, we have five priority kind of strategic priority areas that we support and those you can see on the infographic here societal challenges data visualization reproducibility and data governance and fun fundamental foundational research which is largely in the in the areas of mathematics statistics and computer science and we support those activities through a series of um, horizontal mechanisms uh, which you can also see on the infographic there. So develop events to develop communities such as this. We also provide CCORN funding, for example, once a year in November and other kinds of, of networking opportunities. We run training and professional development courses throughout the year. And you'll see um, from the schedule for data week that there's loads of those this week. But we also offer them um, more spaced out during the rest of the year as well. So keep an eye on that. We're the portal for the University of Bristol's relationship with the Alan Turing Institute, the National Institute for Data Science and AI. And we offer a, um, like a data science surgery service, Ask JGI, where any researcher can pose a query that they have about data science, data intensive research on or AI. And we will work with you to um, try and resolve your issue and point you in the right direction. You're here, so you've registered, so you've probably seen this. Um, uh, the schedule for data science week this week, but you can see we've got 40 events uh, roughly divided between training, which you can see in blue, um, networking events and workshops, as you can see in green and talks, which you can see in yellow. And um, we do hope that you, you find that there's something that interests there for everybody, but we're always looking for suggestions for next year. So please make use of the feedback form. And we want to give a shout out to all the organizations we've worked with to help put on this, uh, this week. Uh, we work with all kinds of, of, of partners, industrial partners, policymakers, NGOs, and we're 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 grateful to you all for your for your help and sponsorship. Um, keep in touch with us. We've, there are lots of mechanisms for carrying on with the, with the relationship with JGI after this. Look at us on Twitter, subscribe to our newsletter, join one of our clubs like the Data Ethics Club, or simply have a look at our blogs or even want to contribute a blog. We'd be delighted to have you. And if you've enjoyed this week, then the next thing, the next hold in your diary ought to be our showcase event, which was postponed because of the pandemic, but, but has been confirmed for the 17th and 18th of February 2022. It'll be a blended event with face-to-face uh, -face, um, activities down at the M Shed, which is a industrial museum at the centre of, of Bristol Harbourside. So very much kind of community facing event, showcasing and celebrating all aspects of data science. So stay in touch with us. And at that point, I'm going to stop sharing and introduce our speakers. So for our session this morning, Mapping the Pandemic, Data Lessons from COVID-19 as part of Data Week Online, we've got three great speakers for us um, today. Dan Lawson. Um, Dan is a data scientist um, based in the Harbron Institute um, and mathematics, developing methodology to compare data from different domains at scale. 
His work spans statistical approaches for diverse data sets, including genetics, cultures, and history. Um, Dr. Sam Tickle, who joined the Harlebron in 2019 as a research fellow. His principal interests include time series analysis, high dimensional inference and sequential algorithm development, uh, particularly the, as those relate to change point detection. And Tom DeCourcy, who is a fourth year maths undergraduate student on the integrated masters, who has recently done a, a worked on a project um, with this collaborative research team. Uh, it's a huge privilege to welcome you all three and I'm going to hand over to Dan um, for the talk. Okay, so hi everyone. Thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. And um, so I'm going to talk uh, at the kind of high level about um, the statistical uh, work that's been going on behind the scenes um, during this COVID epidemic. Um, you know, how have we learned about it? And uh, what is the stats um, and data science community in general um, doing to, to kind of increase preparedness for the next time um, that we have some sort of emergency where uh, stats needs to be deployed very rapidly. Okay, so um, this um, is a, a, a kind of synthesis of um, some research that Sam and I uh, pr proposed to do uh, with um, a team of undergraduates. And we've, we've been very, very fortunate to have um, really excellent uh, people working with us. Um, so you'll hear from Tom uh, very shortly and um, uh, also work from uh, Jacob will be directly presented, but work from all of the other students is being kind of synthesized into what we're discussing here. Um, and in particular, um, content from Dom and Hannah is, um, uh, is in my slides. Um, so Yes, so uh, this team um, of undergraduates is kind of uh, been working on looking at what the methodology uh, used in, in COVID has been and, and in some sense what it should have been. Okay, so the, the starting point for this discussion is um, how we learn about what are the causes of things. So we're, we all, of course, know that the first thing you do is you find a correlation between between two things and then you ask, well, is that a cause? And we know the answer is often no. Um, so, so the first thing that you do is then you say, well, what are the things that could have caused this association? Um, and those are called confounders. So we know that there's, there's measured confounders. So we can go and measure various things that are associated with both our um, our putative cause and our effect and we want to um, to correct for those and we can do that if we've measured them. If we haven't measured them though this is a lot harder and we need to do uh, something else. So what do we do? So one of the key tools is to model putative causes as, as so we, we form some kind of um, mathematical description of what we're uh, of the process, in this case, the epidemic process, and we um, we ask, does it match the data? Now, of course, many models will pr predict um, some features of the data correctly, and some of those will include um, unmeasured confounders and others won't. So, so figuring out which one's right is very hard. And so the, 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 the kind of high level picture of this is that we make these um, hard, non-linear predictions from such models and the more non-linear complex um, surprising predictions that, that the model makes that turn out to be true the the the, the, the greater we uh we we find our, our kind of faith in the assumptions that underlie that model so this is how uh physics and uh, fundamental science has worked um uh, forever basically um, and it's been very very successful in many fields and um, of course um, it really helps if you can get experimental confirmation of uh, of your results you can predict an experiment that you can do that's the hard part here and so um, many people are interested in uh, it's slightly less model based but slightly more um, flexible um, causal reasoning so here, we, instead of making a very specific model, we try to make the, the weakest assumptions that we possibly can that 
so that, that, that they we can have some faith that they are true. So the and examples of this sort of thing are that we know a cause must precede the effect. And so um, this allows us to define something called a, an instrumental variable, which um, is a way of accessing natural experiments that have occurred. So, um, uh, so, so we, we're, we're making assumptions about what precedes uh, what, and this allows us to proceed and make, um, uh, uh, but, but these assumptions are specifically chosen to be uh, weaker. Now, in the next emergency, we're not going to assume we know um, very much about it. The, the, the next emergency, we're not going to, we're not going to have very much information about cause, what causal um, inference um, can be made. We're going to be back in the situation of doing the modelling that we were in the beginning of the COVID epidemic. So we're going to look at this case because the uh, the, the um, automation that can be placed in this modelling arena can be massively improved so that the next time something happens we don't have a very very manual slow step holding everything up. Okay, so uh, when, we're, when we're, we're looking at some data that are uh, just coming in from, from, from wherever we're getting them from, we've got kind of two main choices. We can take, take an approach that's very data driven where we um, uh, try to learn patterns in data. So that's the kind of machine learning and non-parametric statistics approach. And um, fundamentally, all of these things are making a prediction about the future based on saying, well, what in the past uh, matches what the current situation is. And so you've got to have seen what um, situations that are similar to the current situation in, in order to make a good prediction. So it's very greedy with data. And so when you're starting out with um, a new uh, problem space, such as the, um, the COVID epidemic, you need to, to, to do something that's more process based and that incorporates more of your um, uh, knowledge about what's going on. So that's where these susceptible infected and recovered models, SIR um, style models um, of epidemics come in. We know that people who are susceptible are infected only by other infectious people and that there's some recovery process and that this imposes strong structure on what can possibly happen. And if we can incorporate that into our model, we'll do a better job of prediction. So we need these process-based models and they're hard, unfortunately. So, um, so the, the, the good thing about them is that they make these non-linear predictions and those non-linear predictions we know to be um, uh, kind of fundamentally capturing something real, but, um, and the future is not like the past. So, we, you know, all the way through this epidemic, we have never seen a situation where we've already got the data that we need to make the next prediction because everything's always changing. Vaccination has changed everything. Um, changing interventions have changed everything. So there's, there's, there's uh, making a purely data-driven uh, prediction is, is not plausible. So, but, but at the same time, you will have all, all have noticed that the um, predictions for what's gonna happen next have been wrong. And that's not too surprising because people do things that we weren't expecting them to do. But the problem is that they were kind of systematically wrong in the sense that they underestimated their uncertainty. Um, also, they were kind of structurally wrong by, by because the parameters that were in those models were also potentially not well estimated. So that's where we can really make an improvement. So it's all about making good assumptions, making the minimal assumptions to progress, avoiding making false assumptions. And you have to do that because you can prove that not all assumptions are testable. So you can test some assumptions, but not all. OK, so how, do, how have we learned process models? Just taking a big picture approach of this. So um, in the COVID epidemic, the very early models um, were uh, a little embarrassing. So, so, uh, so, so you've got papers like this one, which was very influential. And, and what they did there was they said, let's assume that we know the distribution of the parameters. So we know, for example, that the, um, the amount of time that it takes people to, um, to, to incubate the disease has a specific mean with a specific standard deviation. If we know that, 
then uh, you can make some predictions. And so you can generate these beautiful confidence intervals, but they don't mean anything because they haven't incorporated uncertainty in, whether, in these parameter estimations. So um, of course, any prediction is going to be overconfident. So, so this approach is, is popular because you can do it. It's very, very manual because you have to tune these distributions yourself and it's assumption laden. So we want to be able to pull away from that so that next time we don't have to start here. The, the kind of the next step, which is a paper I was involved in, is to parameterize via um, simulation. So um, you can um, simulate um, uh, a, a much, much wider variety of parameters and essentially just keep the best parameters. So this, this resembles the statistical approach called maximum likelihood. Um, and uh, it's got lots of problems. Uh, it's very hard to build in very soft assumptions, such as we think we, we think we know that R naught should be between certain values. And um, although you can you can extract things that look like probabilities and probability distributions out of uh, out of your predictions, they're not actually calibrated. So they're not you know these these confidence intervals that we could we could portray. They were um, they were not incorporating all of the uncertainty that we knew was there. The, the, um, the more uh, honest way to present your uncertainty is to incorporate all of the potential uncertainty. And, and this is kind of conceptually possible through Bayesian inference. And there is a tool called STAN that lets you do this very easily. You just specify your model, you specify your prior, and then it will go away and learn a, um, a posterior on your data. And there's, a, there's a tutorial for how to do this available online. And um, you can use it if, you've, if you can express your model as a very simple dynamical process. Um, and so th this kind of has the promise of calibrating uncertainty, and that is definitely what we need. Um, it's not as simple as that. And Tom is going to discuss um, the modeling process in, in a lot more detail and, and why that's not trivial. Um, but actually, that's still not the end of the story. So it relies on this, this object called the likelihood, the prob probability of the data given the model. And, um, and so that's great if we can do that, but often the real truth is, is not close to a model for which we can figure out how to compute the, the data given the model. That's a very manual process. Um, but it, if you can just simulate data from your model, you're still able to carry on. Um, so this is a paradigm called simulation-based inference. And um, in the stats department, we tend to focus on the, the Bayesian approach to this, approximate Bayesian computation. This is very um, influential in, in many scientific disciplines, but it's not the only way to do it. And so um, in weather and climate modeling uh, amongst, um, amongst others, um, th there are other paradigms for how to do this and how to do it well. Um, so this idea of simulation-based inference uh, is what many of the students focused on because it's going to be increasingly important for the future of prediction, particularly when you're in this emergency situation of not really having time to do something very manual. So um, in, in uh, I think it was uh, May, certainly summer last year, um, papers started to come out using this. Um, this is an example. But actually, even by summer last year, you can notice that the predictions from such models don't match reality. And this is because it, that there is a, there's a balancing act that you have to pull between making your simulation model sufficiently complicated to, to fit the data, but also sufficiently simple so that you can learn its parameters. So even though it can work on any model in theory, actually, if I tell you to go away and do this right now, you won't be able to because it's quite hard. So the, um, the paradigm starts by saying, well, we've got some priors on, on what the parameters might be and even the models potentially. And then we can generate simulations from those models. We compare those to data. We can accept or reject um, param parameters and models. And, and then we can keep going around this loop until we get enough um, uh, samples so that we think that uh, we can estimate everything nicely. But um, there's two things that makes this really hard. The first is that, um, generating plausible simulations is um, actually really, really hard. So there's there's a lot of 
um, focus on how do we guide our guesses for um, for simulations to bother running into the right place in the, in the parameter space. The other really hard place is to um, automatically compare simulations to the data. Um, and that's a, a hard unsolved problem. So these are the two areas that the stats community and the stats and uh, data science community more broadly are uh, really trying to focus on um, in, the next in the short term. So um, I don't want to talk too much about the, the gory details, but the, the point to say is that there's a zoo of methods that are of increasing sophistication. They span kind of um, 20 and 30 years of um, uh, advanced research in statistics and in machine learning. And um, getting these choices right leads to massive speed up um, in, the, uh, in, in this paradigm, this ABC paradigm. Um, so, you know, if, if you're in this time limited um, situation, then um, faster um, learning is actually more accurate predictions. And so that's vital. We've got to get it fixed. Unfortunately, none of this can be automated. And so, um, you know, really there's this month's lead in time to getting any of these analyses done. And, and that shouldn't be the case. It's, it's, it's kind of conceptually possible to automate it. I'd just like to give a, a, a kind of cartoon for why comparing simulations to data is hard. So let's imagine we've got some epidemic data that shows um, that the north of England has got this kind of high um, uh, infection rate and the south has this low infection rate, as was the case uh, various times in 2020. Um, and, and we've got a simulator that tries to predict this data and it, it matches that the north and south divide is right but but maybe it doesn't have a kind of spatial resolution that lets us know the difference between Birmingham, Newcastle and Manchester in, in terms of the um, the infections that we expect to see. So what we what we find when we simulate data that looks like this is that they don't the data kind of don't match in detail. We don't you know, the simulated Birmingham has less infections than the real Birmingham and, and so on. So all of the, the data is um, kind of not matching. Conversely, if we knew to, to collapse things down um, to, to what the model actually can, can report on, which is the north-south divide in this case, we can get that the, that the mean estimates and the standard deviation of those estimates around the country um, uh, actually do match perfectly. So it's only the details that are wrong. And, and so this leads us to the notion of needing to, to carefully um, define summary statistics. So we need to, to, to um, have a way of automatically generating summaries of the details of the data that capture the, the, the important features of the data and somehow don't throw away um, the, the ability to still distinguish between models. So again, there's a zoo of methods. Again, I'm going to skip over it. Um, th th these are um, growing in sophistication uh, year on year. Um, and again, it's, it's a huge improvement if you get it right. Again, many orders of magnitude. If you get, if if you, if you're too um, uh, permissive, then you um, get very poor accuracy about the, the parameters that that generate good data. Uh, whereas if you're if if you if you are too specific in your requirements for how the data match, then you no parameters are good enough. So it's extremely hard to automate again, and and needs to be done in order to make progress. Okay, so um, this modeling, it's vital for decision making. And if we were, if we had uh, a much shorter production cycle for this modeling, we would have improved decision making in this epidemic. I think that's probably true. Uh, of course, whether anyone made, uh, used the, the information that was available, uh, that was, is, is a different issue. Um, so what are we doing before the next emergency? We're going to speed up the model development cycle. That's what Tom's talking about. We're going to um, exploit um, simulation-based inference more rapidly by increasing automation of parameters and summary statistics. And that's definitely what over half of the Institute for Statistical Sciences, um, uh, it, it was over half of our, our, our research contributes ultimately to, to these goals. So it's definitely the heart of computational data science. So I will stop there and hand over to Tom. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you, Dan. Let me just share my...
screen. Okay, so um, in my projects, I looked at using compartmental-based models to conduct Bayesian inference on the, on the COVID-19 epidemic in England. So more specifically, I looked at creating models that considered the role of asymptomatic individuals in the spread of the disease. And the, the kind of the standard uh, compartmental model for epidemiology is, is the SIR model that Dan mentioned earlier, um, which I'll just go over briefly now. So as you can see here, this is a diagram of the flow of individuals and it partitions the population into three time dependent compartments, the susceptible, the infected and infectious and, and the removed. So I make this distinction here between infected and infectious to highlight one of the assumptions of the model. And that's that of zero latent period. So here we're assuming that individuals are infectious immediately upon infection. Um, another thing we can see from, from this diagram here is that there's no flow from susceptible to removed. So in this case, it corresponds to, so there's only re removal from the dynamics of the disease upon recovery from infection. So for example, no vaccination program with a flow of individuals from susceptible to removed. Now, of course, this could be modified by adding a rate in, but again, it would be difficult to kind of model a, a dynamic rate of uh, a vaccination. So the standard SR model as is has, has two parameters. There's beta and gamma, where beta is the rate of infectious contacts between people and gamma is the, the removal rate. And these are both assumed to be constant. Now, uh, the removal from these two parameters, we can, uh, we can derive some useful quantities for, for comparison. And the uh, first, the removal time, or you can think of this as the infectious duration, which is given by one over gamma. And then we have the, the famous R0, the basic reproductive number. So it's defined in a bit of a wordy manner. It's, it's the, uh, the expected number of secondary infections from a, a single typical infection in a, in a completely susceptible environment. Now, it, just looking at it intuitively, it's some, it's the product of beta, which is the, the infectious rate, um, how infectious an individual is, and versus sort of how long they have to infect someone in, uh, in one over gamma. Now, another assumption of this model that's not very clear from what we've seen so far is, uh, is that of uniform mixing of the population. So in that we assume that individuals in the population meet each other um, completely randomly. So, this is a kind of a very strong assumption of, of homogeneity that's, that's likely invalidated in practice, especially, you know, if you think considering modeling large populations, just simple distance between individuals should mean they have, have different um, probabilities of coming into contact with one another. But it's a, it's a crucial assumption to, to, the, to this model, and it's very common to all these compartmental models. And under this assumption, the, uh, the ODEs, the ordinary differential equations you can see on the right here, have quite a nice intuitive derivation. So we don't need to worry about this, this too much, but um, at any one point, the, uh, the, the proportion of the population infected is given by this ratio I over N. And so multiplying this by the rate of infectious contact, you get the probability that any susceptible person comes infected, becomes infected. So if we multiply this by S, the number of susceptible individuals, you get the expected number of infections and they're leaving the susceptible compartment indicated by this minus sign and entering the, the infected. Okay, and then similarly, the product of the removal rate and the number of infected individuals gives you how many, how many individuals are being removed and entering the, uh, the removed compartment. Now, as I'm sure you can see, this model is not gonna be very useful for, for my aims since it makes no distinction between um, between asymptomatic and symptomatic individuals. That's just a single infected compartment. So tying into what Dan said, thinking about creating the simplest model possible, my, the first model I propose is just a simple partition of the, of the compartment. So in this case, we have the susceptibles flowing into either an asymptomatic or symptomatic and then removed. So under the zero latent period assumption, this symptomatic compartment here should be interpreted as containing the individuals who at some point develop symptoms, so also including their pre-symptomatic phase. So now if we show the, the labeled rate here, um, the kind of the first thing to notice here is I've introduced separate transmission and removal parameters for each compartment. So the subscript A denoting the asymptomatic and the S denoting the symptomatic, and similarly for the, um, for the, uh, the removal rates. So, Another, another thing we need to decide here is how the individuals are split between the asymptomatic and symptomatic compartment. And in this model here, I just propose a, 
a parameter delta, which is the, the constant asymptomatic rate. So it's between zero and one, and it decides how the individuals are split. So the fact that this is assumed constant is again another homogeneous population assumption in keeping with, with these models, in that we're assuming that the, the characteristics of individuals that influence the development of symptoms, so for example, age, health, fitness, they're kind of constant over the modeling period. Okay, and then un okay, with these parameters, the, the R0 for this model, which is useful for, for comparison, as I mentioned before, you can see that it's, it's a, a weighted average of, of the r naughts, if you like, for each compartment, weighted by, by the size of the compartment, the relative size, which is, which is delta here. Now, while this model's simple, which is attractive, there's something slightly kind of unsatisfactory here about the interpretation of the symptomatic compartment, in that we're kind of lumping in the, the, the pre-symptomatic and the symptomatic phase of infection. And moreover, there's no way to distinguish between the early and later phases of infection, which is what motivates the second model, where I simply introduce a pre-symptomatic compartment to contain all the individuals in the early stages of infection, so all the outflow from susceptible, and then the model proceeds as before. So again, I've introduced separate transmission and re removal parameters, this time indexed by the, by the O for the pre-symptomatic compartment, and again, the R0 is very similar. The second, second two terms are exactly as before, except now we have this added contribution from transmission when they're pre-symptomatic. And again, they're split by the rate delta, delta as before. So when we're fitting these models, the first thing is to decide over the period over which we're modeling. So I chose to model between the 14th of September and, and the 11th of October. Now, the reason I did this is, is when we're modeling with these, uh, these models that assume a constant transmission rate, we want to try and model over a period where government interventions, for example, mandated mask wearing or controlling of group sizes and things doesn't change since these would be expected to affect the, the transmission rate. So this was fairly difficult considering the kind of interesting response we had in this country, but uh, I chose the 14th of September to begin because this was just after the rule of six was introduced and then the 11th of October to end, since this was just before the, um, just before the uh, tier system was announced. So the data I used was from the ONS Household Infection Survey. So my results are going to be for a kind of, kind of community view. And they contained model daily rates of infection, monthly antibody presence, and data on the percentage of individuals experiencing symptoms, both at and around the time of their test. So if we remember the interpretation of model one, I'll be using the around data for the symptoms. And for model two, I'll be using the, the at data, again, because of the interpretation of those compartments. Now, one unfortunate thing here, which is, which is common to these, is, is, is a lack of data. So in that the, uh, this symptom data was presented as two week averages. Um, and so I modeled over two of these periods. And uh, in the around data, there was a large jump of around eight, eight percentage points. So for that reason, I decided that I wasn't going to split the case data using, using this symptomatic percentage. And instead, I was going to try and see if the model could predict the size of the compartments. However, for model two, this, uh, there wasn't this problem. So I decided to take a different approach and use the split case data and really try and go for the more for focus on parameter prediction. So uh, as Dan mentioned before, I, I use STAN to fit the model and to implement a, a Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithm. So again, I'm not gonna to worry too much about how this works, but essentially it creates a sample from a, from a distribution on our parameters once, we, once we've seen the, the data, so the posterior. However, before we can begin to implement this algorithm, this is a, this is a Bayesian model. So we need to somehow encode our prior knowledge or, or lack thereof in the form of a prior distribution on the parameters. Now, we need to try and find a balance between having priors that are restrictive enough to exclude absurd outcomes and, and help stabilize our variants, but also uh, our inference, sorry, but also weak enough to allow sufficient exploration of the parameter space and, and deviation from our prior knowledge if, if the data warrants it. So the way this works in reality, it follows, follows this cycle here. So we first encode our, our prior knowledge, and then we look at the prediction based on these, based on our priors. Uh, then, then we observe the data, we look at the prediction error, and we update our knowledge using, using this prediction error, which will then lead us to modify our priors, potentially make them stronger, 
and then we follow the cycle again. So an example here of my of the early model where I had relatively weak priors here. So this is a this is a plot here of the posterior distribution on the transmission rate for the asymptomatics. Now, as you can see, I've run the same inference four times here, so four four of these chains. And as you can see, they're vastly different results. So this is this is very worrying. We shouldn't get very different results for running exactly the same inference. And in fact, some of these chains appear to have a, a bimodal distribution, which you know, doesn't make any sense in, in the context of the model. And so this is an example here where the early priors were not restrictive enough and led to exploration of you know, absurd regions of the parameter space and, and unstable inference. Now, I went through this cycle a few times, and once I had, and found a model that I was happy with, I first looked at the, at the prediction. So here's a plot of the predicted number of cases a priori, so just based off of the prior. So as you can see in, in green here is a 90% is quantile and the black line is, is the median. So it, encom it encompasses a really wide, uh, wide variety of scenarios. So an excess here of 2 million cases or, or as, low as, as low as 100,000. So I can be confident here that it's kind of it's considered a wide, wide, um, wide variety of scenarios. Okay, and so once I ran ran Stan or on the MCMC algorithm, we can look at some results. So th these are some results for the estimated compartment sizes from my first model. So the points here are the data, and you can see here there's that large discrete jump I was talking about in the uh, uh, in the data. Um, but even so, the model has been able to capture, uh, capture this data within the 90% quantile. However, towards the end, you can see that the cases, the rate of growth of the cases appears to decrease. Now, this is something that's impossible to capture with our models since we assume this constant, uh, this constant transmission rate. So that's, again, something that needs to be modified if we're trying to predict out of sample here or over longer periods of time. Okay, and then here are some results for the parameter estimates I got from model two. So as you can see here, the, this kind of modeling exercise I did suggests that the, the asymptomatic transmission rate is significantly larger than both the symptomatic and then the pre-symptomatic. Now, a possible explanation for this could be people you know, not, not isolating if they're asymptomatic, not knowing that they're spreading the disease and then, and then driving infection. Now we can also see here that the, um, the removal time is slightly longer for symptomatic individuals as opposed to asymptomatics. Um, so to conclude, the, the kind of the early models of COVID-19 had not really been around this modeling cycle um, correctly. And you know, some of them either didn't fit the data or they contained parameters that were very difficult to learn from the data. And so the kind of the uncertainty propagation caused by this would uh, only allow short-term predictions and further progress to kind of would, um, would require us to model the effective interventions. Now, this is particularly difficult since, uh, you know, it's, it's very difficult to predict how, in, how interventions will affect the disease in terms of kind of how, how people respond to them, how well they comply and the magnitude of their effect. So in the future, we need ways to kind of speed up this checking and we also need to develop models that can kind of respond dynamically to these, to these interventions. Um, yeah, I think that's what I wanted to talk about. I think I'll, I'll hand you over to Sam. Awesome, thank you very much, Tom. I shall just uh, uh, put my camera on and share my screen. Let me see how I can do, do this with a share track. Uh, great. Okay, awesome. Thanks all. Um, so I'll try not to talk for too long because it'd probably be more interesting to do more questions from sort of quarter two-ish. Um, and you may notice uh, instantly a discrepancy in the uh, title slide here and that my name is not Jacob Howe. Uh, Jacob was a student of, uh, of mine and Dan's as part of the uh, research group that we've been talking about that Tom was a part of. And he was asking the question as to, are we to blame, are students to blame for what we saw with respect to the uh, surge in cases and the resultant second lockdown that we experienced back in, back in the mists of time known as November? And here the picture tells the story. Back in the summer and early autumn of last year, cases were relatively low and then students came back and lo and behold, the number of cases exploded. And we saw a myriad of these uh, uh, articles in the media regarding blaming students or potentially uh, saying that we shouldn't be blaming students for the spiking cases. And so Jacob set out to answer the question as to whether it, this, this is reasonable. Can, can we actually blame students for this rise in cases, sending students back to university? Or in fact, is there something else potentially more subtle going on? 
Okay, so I'm not going to go and dwell on dwell too much on his modeling approach, uh, partially because uh, Tom and Dan have done a very, very good job of uh, talking about very, very similar methods already. So I'll skate over this for the most part. But the one aspect that I do want to draw people's attention to, kind of re-emphasizing what Tom said, is this idea of compartmentalizing the infected cases into symptomatic versus asymptomatic and detected versus undetected. And Jacob's done a very nice uh, table here uh, summarizing these four compartments. Partially because when we're observing different uh, forms of the data for our complex compartmental model that you can see here, we're only observing the bits that have been highlighted, essentially. Uh, these bits in, in yellow, orange, or red. Uh, and again, apologies to any colorblind people in the audience. Um, we have yellow here, orange here, and red here. So what data do we have? Just to clarify, we have daily cases, we have cumulative deaths, and we have the infection survey, all from the ONS. And Jacob was seeking to build a model from the 6th of July to the 6th of September, prior to students coming back for the most part, try and learn about the parameters of the pandemic that we're assuming from this compartmental model, and this, uh, these put in question marks here. Trying to learn about the parameters of the pandemic and see if these parameters shift at all uh, when students return throughout the month of September. Use Bayesian inference and the method that we uh, have all enjoyed today, ABC, approximate Bayesian computation, which as Jacob notes, is not quite as easy as one, two, three, but uh, nevertheless gives us relatively, I think, fair uh, uh, trajectory on the simulated number of cases, which we can see on the left here in the green. We have these uh, simulated daily infections from the ABC model and the 20 to 80% parameter boundary. So this is days since the 6th of July and does a reasonable job throughout July, maybe not throughout August of, uh, of what we see. Um, and death similarly on the left, on the right here. So. Okay, but it's clear that we can start to see some little discrepancies happening as we are already getting a little bit into autumn. What happens if we wind time even further forwards as we go into uh, as we go into uh, this period where students start to come into question. Well, things go completely haywire. So I'm sure you'll agree that the model that we saw before was okay for the summer, maybe starting to waver a bit as we were going into the autumn. It's getting worse and worse as we get into October and November. So this, these parameters that we've learned using ABC um, dur during the summer simply do not seem to be uh, relevant, pertinent uh, during this period. So uh, ditto for deaths, just to, just to uh, underline this point. What can we do to try and pin down the exact point at which our model seems to be deviating from reality? So Jacob used something called change point detection, uh, which is simply the uh, act of locating a point in time where something changes, some aspect of the generating process alters. And he found two change points in the series which uh, it's rather an ingenious idea here, thinking about the observed daily cases and then subtracting off the simulated daily cases. And as you can see, during the period in which uh, things are similar to uh, this period between the 6th of July and the 6th of September, everything is pretty much within bounds of normality, we may, we may say. Then we see a change point on the 18th of September and a second change point on the 28th of September. For deaths, we see changes on the 3rd of September and the 8th of October. And if we put all of these on a timeline and put them against when universities return, schools return, etc., we can start to potentially draw some conclusions. So, for example, we can see that there are seven days between universities returning and this second change in cases, potentially suggestive of, uh, of, of students, in fact, having an impact. And of course, this return date isn't absolute for every university across the country. So uh, given the incubation period of COVID can potentially be more than seven days, this seven days shouldn't be seen as hard and fast. In fact, may well be there's a stronger association than this is suggesting. We're also seeing a 16 day gap between schools returning and this first change in cases, which is the one that really kicked things off, which again, we don't want to draw any sort of direct comparisons and conclusions here, it's just wanted to simply wanted to point out. And finally, the uh, uh, 10 day gap here between the second change in cases and the second change in deaths doesn't seem to be related. Um, I mean, uh, I. Jacob has, has, has done a lot of uh, uh, background checking on this with regards to sort of how, how, how long you can expect to see a filtering through in a change of cases to a change in deaths. And 10 days seems a bit, a, a bit brief, a bit, a bit abrupt. And uh, this, this seems to be underlined by further research. Okay, um, there, are, there are other inferences that he, that he, that he, he drew from this, not least there was a, a Brucey bonus uh, a conclusion that he came to with respect to this, second, this first change in deaths 
which suggested that there's something that happened, something that caused a change on the 3rd of August and coincidentally eat out to help out SARS on the 3rd of August, but uh, I noticed that we've run out of time, so I shall stop there. And if anybody has any questions about that or about students being potentially responsible for the rise in COVID cases uh, more broadly, then I will I'll happily take questions on that on Jacob's behalf. But uh, I do want to say uh, at this point, Thank you to all the students in the research group, in particular Jacob, Josh and Hannah for donating slides, but an extra special thanks to Tom for contributing to today's session. Uh, they've been a pleasure to work with throughout the year and I'm sure Dan will agree, uh, we'll be bowled over by the, the quality of the work we've seen. Great, thank, thank you all three, a really fascinating insight um, into this topic and we do have some time for some questions. I can't see any in the chat. So what I'm gonna do is, is kick off, give people maybe a couple of minutes to think. Um, but I have a question which is around, could any of you say anything about what added complexities, the different characteristics of variants, as in virus variants, might bring to this whole question of predictive modeling? Do you want to kick yeah, off so, so the the, the, the most natural questions are around, um, well, how does it change the, the, the model parameters? So if people, someone's infected with a new strain, does it have the same transmission rate? Does it have the same uh, rate of transmit uh, of that individual moving into asymptomatic versus non-asymptomatic? And um, is the incubation time the, the same? Those are the kind of key parameters. And I think, um, there's clear evidence that um, that those parameters can be affected if the symptoms change, for example, then you pick it up slower. Um, if it's more infectious, then the infection rate goes up. Um, and if, uh, yeah, and, and then kind of resistance to vaccines and so on. So it, it's complicated and um, we would naturally try to model it as um, as coming from um, the uh, the same distribution that we've previously seen, but obviously we'd need to allow for the possibility that that wasn't true. So we kind of need to amass evidence that it wasn't the case, that it was um, th the same as previous. Um, and I haven't done any of that work, so I don't know the answer. I'm going to throw out statistical plastic yeah. and, be, and be sensationalist for a moment and uh, just remind everybody of that plot that we saw that looked at September and Jacob's really nice uh, uh, series and the difference between the observed cases and the sort of uh, learned model from the summer. And it was, I think, really suggested that he found this, this, this sort of period of time in the second half of September where there's this sudden, this sudden deviation from the model. And uh, it just so happens that that was the period in which the variant was first detected, the UK variant, so or the, the Alpha Kent variant. One, the Alpha variant. That's right. So there's a okay. question in the chat. Is there any prediction about when this pandemic could be over? So I think to answer that, you also need to model the evolutionary process. Um, and uh, that's not something I've looked into. I do, do work on genetics and um, my uh, understanding from totally... Uh, distinct uh, organisms is that they're typically quite good at finding a way um, and so uh, yeah it depends on far too many moving parts for me to know the answer um, it's probably not totally knowable from the data available we've got to you know combine um, you've got to you've got to estimate how where in mutation space the the that the disease can move um, and that's hard to, to, to estimate but um, presumably there's, the, the, there is, a, there is a, a several possible worlds um, uh, for, for the future um, including it becoming um, semi-endemic and like flu is needing yearly boosters um, so yes not, not clear to me um, and probably not clear to science in general but I don't know. Thank you. Any other questions? There's quite a bunch of us in the room. There's a few people I'd like to point at, but I'm not gonna <laughs> I'm not gonna do that, but I know you must have some questions. So a comment from Nicola 
also share the same opinion as mutation evolution in the actual virus makes it really messy to predict something like that. Yeah, agreed. Yeah. So the, the experiments you'd need to do are the uh, gain of function experiments that, of course, have caused um, rather a lot of discussion in the um, media. Um, so in order to test whether it's possible to to stamp this out once and for all, we need that sort of data. Mark has a question for me, I think, which is uh, regarding eat out to help out. Yes, I apologize, I skated past that at the speed of light. Um, so this first change in depths, uh, or specifically when the, uh, the model started to uh, be poor at predicting the number of deaths, was at the very, very beginning of September. And this is suggestive based off the sort of time it would take for a, uh, an event to lead to a change in cases, to lead to a change in deaths of something occurring to, uh, uh, to affect the parameters of the pandemic around about the first week of August and the sort of central forecast for that date being the 3rd of August. Uh, and uh, Jacob did this without sort of his calendar open for, for August and he subsequently went back and discovered the 3rd of August was exactly when Eat Out to Help Out started. That's not to say that, oh my goodness, uh, Eat Out to Help Out has, has, has killed many, many people. And in fact, that first change in deaths, if you remember from the, from the plot, it wasn't necessarily obvious that it was a, it was a change leading to something dramatic and that was probably later on in the uh, in the autumn um but it was it was it was too, it was too juicy not to uh, not to completely un, uh, uh, not report uh, as, as it were uh so just a little bit of red meat uh, for, for 10 pounds off or whatever it was great okay um if there are no more questions then oh no there is one matt how easy hard will it be to use the data to predict the mistake successes of the government change? And will this help guide future policy and government decisions? <laughs> I think Dan and I have, probably have quite a few comments on this. Do you want to go first, Dan? Um, so, I mean, retrospective analysis is, is easier than prediction, of course. Um, so I'm sure we will go over this data in detail and scrape up all sorts of mistakes. Um, You'll never get conclusive evidence because we've only got one history. Um, uh, but I'm sure we will find some uh, pretty damning evidence of poor decisions. That is kind of expected, I think. Um, will it help? Um, so Dan and I were, I think, part of another JGI event back in December when we were talking about pretty much this question. Uh, with respect to a project both of, both Dan and I had done earlier in 2020 with respect to looking at government responses across uh, most of Europe, um, tracking, for example, the Blavatnik data set. Blavatnik is a, is a data set provided by, uh, I think, hosted by the University of Oxford. Uh, don't absolutely quote me on that. And you can see the uh, very nice tracking of, of government policy uh, across a number of countries uh, since the beginning of the pandemic. And we could use this to sort of Attempt, attempt to see the effects maybe of, of, of a policy in isolation. That's still quite hard to do, um, but it's, it's, it's a little bit easier than just looking at, at, at purely one country. Um, and I think, uh, I, I can't remember exactly all the conclusions Diane and I came to back in December. I, I, my long-term memory is appalling. Um, but, but fundamentally, we were able to say, for example, that uh, policy A seemed to be not very sensible, policy B seemed to be more sensible, um, but that was with the benefit of a year's worth of data and now we have two so in theory our conclusion should be twice as good right and there's one last comment could further mutations oh hang on could further mutations lead to weaken the virus i'm not sure we've got any virologists in the audience but my understanding is is possibly yes um but i don't know if anyone else has any comments on that Uh, so, Simon Lee has a query. Um, Dan, you spoke on the need to automate the processes of picking plausible model parameters and then sensible summary statistics to compare the simulated results to reality. These both sound difficult to do in a way that is general to any future emergency we might face. What work is being done or can be done to generally speed up these processes? So, I, th I think that's a that's a brilliant question, and um, the the. The uh, amount of automation that can be done will only increase with these simulation-based methods. Um, uh, the, the, um, the main approach about learning which uh, summary statistics uh, 
to use is to, to, to um, deploy machine learning style approaches. You simulate loads and loads of um, parameters and then you learn um, how to compress um, the, 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 uh, the, the data such that you can still re recover the parameters that generated those data. So that is, um, is solvable and it's going to be much more push button for um, uh, for at least for for simplish models um, in the, in the next few years. It's it's definitely changed immensely over the last um, couple of years, uh, and it's changing still. Um, the um, the issue around choosing model parameters again is 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 very much an active area of development. A lot of people are working on it. Um, machine learning is being kind of melded into the statistical and um, process-based modeling. Um, and um, uh, so the, 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 there are strong methodologies um, such as um, uh, sequential Monte Carlo approaches and um, uh, something called normalizing flows. Um, that, so there's a lot of technical details and we can, I can discuss these